Hello there. Back again for a second chapter in Farmer Boy by Laura Ingalls Wilder. Um, we had just found out um, kind of a little bit of how they went to school, and I hope you could see, you know, some comparing and contrasting about their school um, day with your school day. And um, I'm, I'm interested to see how, you know, what, you know, similarities and differences that you found between their school day and your school day. Um, and now we're going to talk about winter evenings. So um, the first couple of chapters are, are kind of um, broken up, um, kind of like the, the how their day goes. And then we're going to see how different things happen in different seasons as the, as the, the book goes on. So we're going to be on page 13, winter evening, for you to follow along with me. Oh, and one thing you can see in that picture, that's one of the lanterns, the tin lanterns. I mean, you can see all the little holes that are poked through, so that way you can see the light. And notice they're hanging it on a peg. They're not putting it down in the straw um, or down on the floor in the in the barn because inside that, they don't have electricity, right? So their, their light is by candlelight, and candlelight is fire. So they didn't want to, you know, this to tip over. So notice how they put it up on a, on a, on a, piece of wood that's sticking out on the post. Winter evening. The air was still as ice and the twigs were snapping in the cold. A gray light came from the snow, but shadows were gathering in the woods. It was dusk when Almanzo trudged up the last slope to the farmhouse. He hurried behind Royal, who hurried behind Mr. Course. Alice walked fast behind Eliza Jane in the other sled track. They kept their mouths covered from the cold and did not say anything. So remember, Mr. Course stays with each family member for two weeks at a time, and it is Almanzo's family's turn to host Mr. Course for two weeks. The roof of the tall red painted house was rounded with snow, and from the eaves hung a fringe of great icicles. The front of the house was dark, but a sled track went to the big barns, and a path had been shoveled to the side door, and candlelight shone in the kitchen windows. Amonzo did not go into the house. He gave the dinner pail to Alice, and he went to the barns with Royal. There were three long, enormous barns around three sides of the square barnyard. Altogether, they were the finest barns in all that country. Amonzo went first into the horse barn. It faced the house, and it was 100 feet long. The horse's row of box stalls was in the middle. At one end was the calves' shed, and beyond it was a snug hen house. At the other end was the buggy house. It was so large that two buggies and the sleigh could be driven into it with plenty of room to unhitch the horses. The horses went from it into their stalls without going out again into the cold. The big barn began at the west end of the horse barn and made the west side of the barnyard. In the big barn's middle was the big barn floor. Great doors opened onto it from the meadows to let loaded hay wagons in. On one side was the great hay bay, 15 feet long and 20 feet wide crammed full of hay into the peak of the roof far overhead. Beyond the big barn floor were 14 stalls for the cows and oxen. Beyond them was the machine shed, and beyond it was the tool shed. There he turned the corner into the south barn. In it was the feed room, then the hog pens, then the calf pens, then the south barn floor. That was the threshing floor. It was even larger than the big barn floor, and the fanning mill stood there. And we're going to learn about all these different pieces um, as the chapters go on. So I don't want to go into a lot of detail about what different things are because we're going to learn in more detail in um, later chapters. Beyond the south barn floor was a shed for the young cattle and beyond it was the sheepfold. That was all of the south barn. A tight board fence 12 feet high stood along the east side of the barnyard. The three huge barns and the fence walled in the snug yard. Winds howled and snow beat against them, but could not get in. No matter how stormy the weather, there was hardly ever more than two feet of snow in the sheltered barnyard. When Almanza went into these great barns, he always went through the horse barn's little door. He loved horses. There they stood in their roomy box stalls, clean and sleek and gleaming brown with long black manes and tails. The wise, sedate workhorses placidly munched hay. The three-year-olds put their noses together across the bars. They seemed to whisper together. Then softly their nostrils whooshed along one another's necks. One pretended to bite, and they squealed and whirred and kicked and played. The old horses turned their heads and looked like grandmothers at the young ones. But the colts ran about excited on their gangling legs that, and stared and wondered. They all knew Amonzo. Their ears pricked up and their eyes shone softly when they saw him. 
The three-year-olds came eagerly and thrust their heads out to nuzzle at him. Their noses, prickled with a few stiff hairs, were soft as velvet, and on their foreheads the short, fine hair was silky smooth. Their necks arched proudly firm and round, and the black manes fell, fell over them like a heavy fringe. You could run your hand along those firm, curved necks in the warmth under the mane. But Almanzo hardly dared to do it. He was not allowed to touch the beautiful three-year-olds. He could not go into their stalls, not even to clean them. Father would not let him handle the young horses or the colts. Father didn't trust him yet, because colts and young unbroken horses were very easily spoiled. A boy who didn't know any better might scare a young horse, or tease it, or even strike it, and that would ruin it. It would learn to bite and kick and hate people, and then it would never be a good horse. Amonzo did know better. He wouldn't ever scare or hurt one of those beautiful colts. He would always be quiet and gentle and patient. He wouldn't startle a colt or shout at it, not even if it stepped on his foot. But Father wouldn't believe this, because remember, he was, wasn't quite nine years old yet, so he's still too young to be around those horses that hadn't been, um, t been taught yet all the things that they need to, to learn. So Amonzo could only look longingly at the eager three-year-olds. He just touched their velvety noses and then he went quickly away from them and put on his barn frock over his good school clothes. So he had like a, um, like a jacket, but it was super long, like down almost to, to his ankles pretty much. And it would cover his clothes so that way his, his school clothes wouldn't get dirty. Um, because they didn't wash them all the time. He w would wear his school clothes pretty much all week and they would get washed on the weekend. So, um, so he had to cover up with this barn frock with this, with this basically this long coat so that way he wouldn't get all dirty while he did his chores. Father had already watered all the stock and he was beginning to give them their grain. Royal and Almanzo took pitchforks and went from stall to stall cleaning out the soiled hay underfoot and spreading fresh hay from the manger to make clean beds for the cows and the oxen and the calves and the sheep. They did not have to make beds for the hogs because hogs make their own beds and keep them clean. In the south barn, Almanzo's own two little calves were in one stall. They came crowding each other at the bars when they saw him. Both calves were red, and one had a white spot on his forehead. Almanzo had named him Star. The other was a bright red all over, and Almanzo called him Bright. Star and Bright were young calves, not yet a year old. Their little horns had only begun to grow in the soft hair by their, in the soft hair by their ears. Almanzo scratched around the little horns because calves like that. They pushed their moist, blunt noses between the bars and licked with their rough tongues. Amonzo took two carrots from the cow's feed box and snapped little pieces off them and fed the pieces one by one to Star and Bright. Then he took his pitchfork again and climbed into the hay mows overhead. It was dark there, only a little light came from the pierced tin sides of the lantern hung in the alleyway below. Remember that, the lantern that I told you about? Royal and Amonzo were not allowed to take the lantern into the hay mows for fear of fire, but in a moment they could see in the dark. They worked fast, pitching hay into the mangers below. Amonzo could hear the crunching of all the animals eating. The hay mouths were warm with the warmth of all the stock below, and the hay smelled dusty sweet. There was a smell, too, of the horses and cows and woolly smell of the sheep. And before the boys finished filling the mangers, there was a good smell of warm milk foaming into Father's milk pail. Amonzo took his own little milking stool in a pail and sat in Blossom's stall to milk her. His hands were not yet strong enough to milk a hard milker, but he could milk Blossom and Bossy. They were good old cows who gave down their milk easily and hardly ever switched a stinging tail into his eyes or upset the pail with a hind foot. And you can see in that picture how he, the frock that he's wearing, see how long it is, and it covers all of his clothes, and that's one of the, the cows that he's milking. He sat with the pail, pail between his feet and milked steadily, left, right, swish. The streams of milk slanted into the pail while the cows licked up their grain and crunched their carrots. The barn cats curved their bodies against the corners of the stall, loudly purring. They were sleek and fat from eating mice. Every barn cat had large ears and a long tail, sure signs of a good mouser. And they needed them, right? They needed the cats to keep the mice away from the grain bins. Day and night they patrolled the barns, keeping mice and rats from the feed bins, and at milking time they lapped up pans of warm milk. When Alonzo had finished milking, he filled the pans for the cats. His father went into Blossom's stall with his own pail and stool, and he sat down to strip the last richest drops of milk from Blossom's udder. But Almanzo had got it all. Then father went to Bossy's stall. He came out and once again and went at once and said, You're a good milker, son. So father didn't really need to follow behind. He was able to get everything, all the last drops of good 
of the good milk out of the um, cow's udders. Almanzo just turned around and kicked at the straw on the floor. He was too pleased to say anything. Now he could milk cows by himself. Father needn't strip them after him. Pretty soon he would be milking the hardest milkers. Amonzo's father had pleasant blue eyes that twinkled. He was a big man with a long, soft brown beard and soft brown hair. His frock of brown wool hung to the tops of his tall boots. The two fronts of it were crossed on his broad chest and belted snug around his waist. Then the skirt of it hung down over his trousers of good brown full cloth. Father was an important man. He had a good farm. He drove the best horses in that country. His word was as good as his bond, and every year he put money in the bank. When father drove into Malone, all the townspeople spoke to him respectfully. Royal came up with his milk pail and the lantern, and he said in a low voice, Father, Big Bill Ritchie came to school today. The holes in the tin lantern freckled everything with little lights and shadows. Amonzo could see that father looked solemn. He stroked his beard and slowly shook his head. Amonzo waited anxiously, but father only took the lantern and made a last round of the barns to see that everything was snug for the night. Then they went into the house. The cold was cruel. The night was black and still, and the stars were tiny sparkles in the sky. Almanza was glad to get into the big kitchen warm with fire and candlelight. He was very hungry. Soft water from the rain barrel was warming on the stove. First father, then Royal, then Almanzo took his turn at the wash basin on the bench by the door. So you notice eldest to youngest, right, are washing their hands. They had put water, they had, they had rain barrels outside, um, that would catch the water that dripped from the, the roof of the house and then they would dip and they would get that water and they would bring that in and they would heat that up and that's what they would use to um, wash their hands. So, oh, sorry. The kitchen was full of, oh, sorry. I again, sorry. Um, Almanza wiped on the linen roller towel then standing before the little mirror on the wall he parted his wet hair and combed it smoothly down. The kitchen was full of hoop skirts balancing and swirling. So that's the dresses. They, the dresses the girls had had these wide, if you were, like a hula hoop. It was almost like that was in the bottom of their dress. And it like made it like a, they would swing when they would move. Eliza, Jane, and Alice were hurrying to dish up supper. The salty brown smell of frying ham made Almanzo's stomach gnaw inside him. He stopped just a minute in the pantry door. Mother was straining the milk. At the far end the long pantry, of the long pantry, her back was toward him. The shelves on both sides were loaded with good things to eat. Big yellow cheeses were stacked there, and large brown cakes of maple sugar, and there were crusty loaves of fresh-baked bread, and four large cakes, and one whole shelf full of pies. One of the pies was cut, and a little piece of crust was temptingly broken off. It would never be missed. Amonzo hadn't even moved yet, but Amonzo, Amon, Eliza Jane cried out, Amonzo, you stop that. Mother! Mother didn't turn around, and she said, Leave that be, Amonzo, you spoil your supper. That was so senseless that it made Amonzo mad. One little bite couldn't spoil a supper. He was starving, and they wouldn't let him eat anything until they had put it on the table. There wasn't any sense in it, but of course he could not say this to Mother. He had to obey her without a word. He stuck his tongue out at Eliza Jane. She couldn't do anything. Her hands were full. Then he went quickly into the dining room. The lamplight was dazzling. By the square heating stove set into the wall, Father was talking politics with Mr. to Mr. Course. Father's face was toward the supper table, and Almanzo dared not touch anything on it. There were slabs of tempting cheese. There was a plate of quivering head cheese. There were glass dishes of jams and jellies and preserves and a tall pitcher of milk and a steaming pan of baked beans and with a crisp bit of fat pork and the crumbling brown crust. Amonzo looked at them all and something twisted in his middle. He swallowed and went slowly away. The dining room was pretty. There were green stripes and rows of tiny red flowers on the chocolate brown wallpaper, and Mother had woven the rag carpet to match. She had dyed the rags green and chocolate brown and woven them into stri in strips, in stripes with a tiny stripe of red and white rags twisted together between them. The tall corner cupboards were full of fascinating things, seashells and petrified wood and curious rocks and books, and over the center table hung an, hung an air castle. Alice had made it of clean yellow wheat straws, set together airily with bits of bright colored cloth at the corners. It swayed and quivered in the slightest breath of air, and the lamplight ran gleaming along the golden straw. But to Almanzo, the most beautiful sight was his mother, bringing in the big willow-whirl platter full of sizzling ham. Mother was short and plump and pretty. 
Her eyes were blue, and her brown hair was like a bird's smooth wings. A row of little red buttons ran down the front of her dress of wine-colored wool, from her flat white linen collar to the white apron tied around her waist. Her big sleeves hung like red, large red bells at either end of the blue platter. She came through the doorway with a little pause and a tug because her hoop skirts were wider than the door. The smell of the ham was almost more than Almanzo could bear. Mother set the platter on the table. She looked to see that everything was ready and the table properly set. She took off her apron and hung it in the kitchen. She waited until Father had finished what he was saying to Mr. Corse. But at last she said, James, supper is ready. It seemed like a long time before they were all in their places. Father sat at the head of the table, Mother at the foot. They all must bow their heads while Father asked God to bless the food. After that, there was a little pause before Father unfolded his napkin and tucked it in the neckband of his frock. He began to fill the plates. First, he filled Mr. Corsa's plate, then Mother's, then Royal's, and Eliza Jane's, and Alice's, then at last, he filled Almanzo's plate. So he went company, then oldest to youngest. So Almanzo had to wait to be last. Thank you, Almanzo said. Those were the only words he was allowed to speak at the table. Children must be seen and not heard. Father and mother and Mr. Corse could talk, but Royal and Eliza Jane and Alice and Almanzo must not say a word. Almanzo ate the sweet, mellow, baked beans. He ate the bit of salt pork that melted like cream in his mouth. He ate mealy boiled potatoes with brown ham gravy. He ate the ham he bit deep into velvety bread spread with sleek butter, and he ate the crisp golden crust. He demolished a tall heap of pale mashed turnips and a hill of stewed yellow pumpkin. Then he sighed, tucked his napkin deeper into the neckband of his waist, red waist, and he ate plum preserves and strawberry jam and grape jelly and spiced watermelon rind pickles. He felt very comfortable inside, and slowly he ate a large piece of pumpkin pie. Lots of food, huh? But they needed lots of food that gave them their energy. They didn't snack throughout the day, so they would eat their breakfast, their dinner, or their lunch, and their supper. So, and they did a lot, right? They worked a lot. They walked from school to home. So they were very busy. So they, they had to fill their bellies and, and have a really good meal, have those really big meals. So that way they could do all the, the jobs they needed to do. He heard father say to Mr. Corse, the hard scrabble, scrabble boys came to school today, Royal tells me. Yes, Mr. Corse said. I hear they're saying they'll throw you out. Mr. Corse said, I guess they'll be trying it. Father blew on the tea in his saucer. He tasted it, then drained the saucer and poured a little more tea into it. They've driven out two teachers, he said. Last year, they hurt Jonas Lane so bad, he died of it later. I know, Mr. Corse said. Jonas Lane and I went to school together. He was my friend. Father did not say any more. So those hard scrabble boys are pretty rough. They were so rough to the teacher before Mr. Corse, they hurt him so badly when they beat him that he ended up dying of, of his wounds and his injuries from their beating. So um, father's just, you know, kind of giving him some insight or giving him some information and he's finding out that Mr. Corse already knew. So they, you know, we're just having a conversation about those hard scrabble boys and how, how mean and rough they are. So you're going to answer the questions for chapter two, and that's a winter evening. And um, make sure, again, you're you're looking for the, the um, evidence in the chapter to help you support your answers. Um, complete sentences, capital letters, periods, that all counts towards your grade. And I hope, again, that you're enjoying this book, and I will see you soon for chapter three. All right, have a good day. Bye, guys.